our first session on fossil man, we looked at the evidence regarding Australopithecus. This is the, the first in the, on the rung of the ladder that leads up to modern men on this ladder of graduated fossil men that's supposed to be a demonstration of evolution. But as we look at this first rung of the ladder, uh, including Lucy, one of them, uh, we see that these were apes. This is not a conclusion that we reach because of our Sunday school lessons, but because of paleoanthropology and because of the, the statements of the leading authorities about the nature of these uh, specimens. Uh, there obviously are those who will say this is an uh, ancestor of man, but you, often they're the ones that found them, or as we say down in Texas, they have a dog in the fight. But they have others who are leading authorities in the field who point out with good reason that this is not the case. Many times the evidence is gerrymandered and we saw demonstrations of that. The next one on the rung of the ladder is Homo erectus. That's supposed to lead on up eventually to man. And here we go back in history to look at the beginning of uh, the evidence for Homo erectus. Historically, this is where the search for fossil man begins. In this famous picture, we see the leading paleoanthropologist of the time, uh, actually there at Cambridge, and we see Black and Dawson and Oakley and those who were convinced that the Piltdown Man was uh, an excellent fossil uh, specimen leading that was leading the man. This was uh, an ancestor of man, and of course it was a fraud. It was in the textbooks for over 40 years before it was finally exposed as fraud, and the men of science eventually did. Um, it should have been done much earlier. Uh, it was very crudely stained and filed. Uh, the evidence was excluded from the leading authorities. Uh, Louis Leakey complained bitterly that while he was a student there at Cambridge, the bones were there and he was not allowed to examine them like these famous men did, who were willing to line up and agree that this was a fossil man. But when they finally did allow them to be examined, it was acknowledged uh, to be a fraud. Very interesting statement is made about that by Roger Lewin, uh, again, editor of Research News in his book, Bones of Contention. And by the way, the book, Bones of Contention, while uh, affirming great ages and certainly uh, written by a devout believer, in evolution, nevertheless, is pretty historically accurate uh, and is an interesting book and tells the story of exactly how these things were found and the conclusions that were reached and why. But he, regarding the Piltdown Man and this picture that we looked at just a moment ago, how is it that trained men, the greatest experts of their day, could look at a set of modern human bones, the cranial fragments? and see a clear simian signature in them. Now, they saw this. They saw ape, <laughs> simian signature in what was actually a modern human bone and then see in an ape's jaw the unmistakable signs of humanity. Now, it was from an ape, but they saw humanity in it. Now, how is it that the greatest experts of their day could do that? We think experts know these things. He says, the answers inevitably have to do with the scientist's expectations and their effects on the interpretation of the data. As he uh, pointed out earlier, they have to interpret. The key issue is inferring a genetic relationship based on similarities that they see. Uh, well, they expect to see certain similarities and they see <laughs> what they tell us about it. Someone says, if I hadn't have believed it, I wouldn't have seen it, uh, is probably a, a better depiction of what we see in this case, as acknowledged by Roger Leland. We go back in time, and after the Piltdown Man, we found that uh, uh, Henry Osborne of the American Museum of Natural History decided that we needed a fossil man over in America. Uh, maybe he thought the people in Nebraska looked primitive, and so he went to Nebraska and found a tooth that he says looked like this in real life. 
This is Hesperopithecus Harold Cookai. Uh, Harold Cook was the one who actually found uh, the bone and brought it uh, to Dr. Osborne. But he restored it and uh, had this made the front page of the New York Times. Uh, it said he walked erect and had a tail. And uh, anyway, this, this was America's answer to the Piltdown Man, the fossil man from America, Hesperopithecus Harold Cookai. Well, he allowed the experts to examine this and uh, they began to look at more evidence. Several were very, very skeptical. Uh, and then the next year they found a complete jawbone with several teeth like this in it and it turned out to be an extinct peccary or a, a type of pig. As uh, one person, that's one case where uh, a pig made a monkey out of a man and uh, some of them suggested that maybe they should have called it Hespero pig done fulum cuckoo. Uh, he took, uh, took a lot of flack <laughs> and I think appropriately. But this is the nature of the history of the early stages of fossil man, and it begins in this category of, of Homo erectus. Another example is the Java man. This was found by Eugene Dubois. He read, as according to his own acknowledgement, uh, Darwin's statement somewhere there's an ape more human-like or a human more ape-like, and this will be the evidence that'll be found, so he went out to find it, and he traveled to Java. Uh, he thought the people in Java looked primitive. This was a part of his racist concept. And so he looked for primitive man uh, there on the island of Java. Uh, he found a very human-like leg bone. He found a very ape-like head bone uh, about 75 yards apart in different layers. A few teeth were found later, but that's uh, the total <laughs> of what he found. Uh, more evidence has bound, been found subsequently, which did not fit with his conclusions. But this uh, ape uh, skull and uh, human leg uh, makes an ape man and put them together and uh, restored them to look very, very ape manish. Uh, he did find other evidence that he didn't tell people about. And you don't learn about this usually, certainly not in your undergraduate work. Uh, this is Wajak 1. Uh, as he's restored by Coons, a very large-brained, uh, much larger than our average today. This was almost 1,700 cc's compared to our average 1,440. Uh, was found in the same area, uh, in, in the same layer, but he hid it. He put it under his dining room floor and nailed the boards over it, and it wasn't uh, for 40 years, 40 years, uh, later that they finally found out about Wajak 1 that was found with uh, this partial cranium and partial leg bone. But that's all faded, though not from all the textbooks, some of them, by more recent finds of excellent examples and they weren't nearly as old as they thought. Uh, and now that they realize that uh, there were very modern looking skeletons uh, forms there found with them. And here we find uh, one of the leading authorities here reporting in Science News, uh, Milford Wolpruf uh, of the University of Michigan. He argues that Homo erectus fossils actually belong to an anatomically diverse form of Homo sapien. That's us. And so we see Eskimos that are a little different and uh, Australian Aboriginals that are a little different and we see the Bushmen that are a little different from the Ubangis and we see variations of good men and this was a variation but it was a Homo sapien. This was a man and Java man doesn't belong in the lineup anymore. He was already Homo sapien according to the leading authorities. He's in the textbooks many times, though uh, acknowledging that uh, many of them have been removed. Uh, 1470 skull, new, new uh, uh, Kenya uh, National Museum, uh, found by Richard Leakey, is one of the leading representatives today of Homo erectus. Uh, originally, it caused a lot of problem. They had to do some redating and some gerrymandering in order to get this to fit into the tree. But here is a very uh, human looking skull that's supposed to have been found back at the time actually of uh, Australopithecus but uh, crazy it's very human looking so they put it in Homo erectus uh, but notice the description that we find in National Geographic 
regarding Leakey's find. Either we toss out this skull or we toss out our theories of early man, asserts anthropologist Richard Leakey, uh, of this 2.8 million year old fossil, which he has tentatively identified as belonging to our own genus. genus. Um, now 2.8 million, that puts it right in the middle of Australopithecus. You got to do something about that. So they took it to California and had it redated and is now 1.9, we're told. But it's still very, very human-like. Uh, it simply fits no theories. Notice the description. Uh, no uh, previous models of human beginnings. The skull is surprisingly large brain case. It's, with, it's all compared to ours, but certainly within the range of humans today. It leaves in ruins the notion that all early fossils can be arranged in an orderly sequence of evolutionary change. Now, a large brain case with this no brow ridges, vaulted skull. Now, brow ridges are supposed to be primitive. I get a little bit sensitive about <laughs> brow ridges indicating that people are primitive. Uh, but this one didn't have that, and so it was supposed to be non-primitive and a large brain case. Uh, but it's back at the time of Australopithecus. We learned more about the brain case when we looked at the endocast. These are casts that fill the cavity of the brain and then the bone peels away and we see exactly what the brain looked like. Uh, here's some pictures of those endocasts uh, that tell us excellent, uh, give excellent evidence for exactly what the brain looked like. Dean Falk is one of the experts in studying this and he says uh, this is not Homo habilis. Uh, Homo habilis is uh, very ape-like. That's uh, used to be touted as uh, leading to man, but uh, when they found the more complete specimen with the huge arms, actually uh, much <laughs> longer arms than most apes have and very small brain case, they have relegated this to the category of apes at this point. But it's different, he says. This is similar uh, to, to the African project that is uh, Homo erectus. But the 1470 skull is shaped like that of a <laughs> modern human. Now, they don't tell you that in the textbooks, but this brain was like a modern human. We're also referred to another example of Homo erectus. This is found by Richard Leakey, and this is the boy from Turkana, Turkana boy. Uh, they thought it was uh, 11 years old initially and then found out it was even younger than that, which makes for a, a significant problem. Uh, notice again from National Geographic, the boy from Turkana was surprisingly large compared with modern boys his age. Could well have grown to six feet. Uh, Leakey says the boy from, uh, it would be unnoticed in a crowd today. And then continues with this amazing statement. This combines with the previous discoveries of Homo erectus to contradict a long-held idea that humans have grown larger over the millennia. Uh, have you heard that idea and that it's been contradicted? <laughs> well, if you've got uh, a boy that is five, six, and uh, is nine years old, uh, it doesn't sound very small to me. In fact, that's larger than the boys that we have today. And uh, this is documented in Origin of Humankind by Richard Leakey. We now know that he was nine years old, not 11, and he was 5'6", here shown with uh, Dr. White, who illustrates just how large this uh, nine-year-old was. Other problems have been found with uh, Homo erectus. The specimen uh, Howells goes on to say, with a date of about 4.4 million, and he's talking here about uh, uh, another specimen that uh, sometimes called uh, 271, Canopy Man, and it's from the area of Canopy. Four point million, well now that gets us back earlier than virtually all of the Australopithecine specimens, but it could not be distinguished from Homo sapien. Uh, morphologically, that's by the shape, outward shape, or by multivariate analysis by Patterson and myself in 67, uh, or by much more searching analysis by others since then. Now this has been around a while, they've known about it. It couldn't be distinguished from Homo sapien, but it was older than those things that are supposed to have led to ho uh, Homo sapien. So what do they do with it? They call it a Homo erectus. I don't think that solves the problem. Now multivariate analysis is 
uh, a very thorough comparison. We uh, talked about the eyeballing. This is similar to that. Well, with multivariate analysis, you measure a bone about a thousand different ways, and you measure the bone you're comparing it with exactly the same way, about a thousand different ways, and then you put it in the computer, and the computer gives you a statistical readout of just how similar they are. But by using that method, as well as morphologically and even more searching analysis, according to Howells, uh, it couldn't be distinguished from Homo sapien. And it's older than anything supposed to have led to him. <laughs> Homo erectus then is summarized this way. Java man no longer really in the lineup by most uh, assessments, uh, belonging to Homo sapien. Uh, Turkana boy is certainly there, but he's large and unnoticed in a crowd, larger than our boys today. Uh, 1470, according to Mary, uh, Richard Leakey, uh, like modern humans, and then the, the brains were like modern humans. The Latoy footprints are put in the category of Homo erectus, but they are people, according to Mary Leakey, not unlike ourselves. She discovered them. And then you have Canopy Man at 4.4 million that's indistinguishable from Homo sapien. What are we looking at here? Is there any question about what we're looking at here? These are people. These are men. Uh, some of them uh, may have lived in the jungle. Some of them may have lived in caves. We have people doing that today. But these were people. These were good men. And that's not based on wishful thinking. When you look at the actual evidence and the statements by the leading authorities, that's what you have to say. It's not really honest to say it otherwise. That brings us then to the next rung of the ladder, Neanderthal. Well, we've all seen the Neanderthal reconstructions. We know this, this certainly looks like an ape man. And yes, the reconstructions certainly do. And if we found those in the back alley, it would scare the living daylights out of us. Uh, this is a type that was first found in the Neander Valley, hence the name Neanderthal, uh, in Germany and restored very quickly to look like this by Marcel and Buell. And uh, he had, of course, uh, read Darwin, and he, has, uh, he believed devoutly there was an ape man somewhere, and so he restored it to look like that. Remember Hooten's statements, you can model on the Neanderthal skull the features of a chimpanzee, the lightments of a philosopher. Well, he did a lot of that uh, <laughs> uh, modeling and did so very poorly, as leading authorities acknowledge today. This is Marcel and Buell, devout believer who was responsible for this misleading representation. Let's set the record straight with Ian Tattersall. Now, this is no lightweight. He is head of the Department of Anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, again, this is not a creationist. This is not my idea head of the Department of Anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History. This fellow knows a little bit about anthropology. He says, quite as important as new Neanderthal finds in the 50s, and this, this helped us change our view of Neanderthals, we found some new specimens, was the recognition finally that the stoop-shouldered, bent-kneed stereotype of these humans created by Marcel and Buell was totally false. Now, that's his assessment. The head of the Department of Anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History said, this is false. But guess where you find it? <laughs> in the museums and in the textbooks, this is not the way he looked. Uh, Richard Leakey comments on this. He says, to refer to someone as a Neanderthal was and still is to some extent an intended insult. But then he says the rehabilitation, however, began in the mid-50s when two anatomists, uh, William Strauss, uh, A.J.E. Cave, undertook a second reconstruction, a body which, though somewhat uh, stocky, was essentially like modern man's, and essentially meaning he doesn't see any difference, and says they would be unnoticed in a crowd again put him in a Brooks Brothers suit and you'd never know that uh, he was different. He's been rehabilitated, according to Richard Leakey. He goes on to say the brain is slightly larger than modern humans, averaging about 1,600 cc's, again, compared to our 1440. Uh, the Neanderthal's average height was 1.67 meters. That's 5'8". Uh, that's not considered unusual. 
uh, average oriental is just a little bit shorter than that. And so well within the range of variation that we see today, not unique, and is unquestionably, Richard Leakey says, homo sapien. That's us, that's modern man. Interesting that Coons attempted two different restorations from the same Neanderthal skull, neither one looking like the typical Neanderthal skull, but here we see a rather philosophical looking face on the left and then uh, maybe somebody that belongs on Mad Magazine on the right, but both of them from the same Neanderthal skull. Uh, Matt Cartmill that we introduced earlier claiming he was a leading authority, he is president of the American Association of Physical Anthropology. Again, these are not lightweights. I tend to think they, the Neanderthals, had fully human language. After all, they had larger brains than those of most modern humans. They made elegant stone tools. They knew how to use them. Uh, these were people uh, making tools very much like the American Indians made tools. This is an example of uh, some of their handiwork, a flute uh, that was reported on in Science and Scientific American that has exactly the same scale that we do, uh, the do, re, mi scale that we have today. They were musical. Uh, and they were religious, according to Richard Leakey. Uh, he speaks of the tomb that they found that was buried with flowers and with specific uh, arrangements indicating uh, a kind of burial ceremony. He says the arrangement of flowers was not random. They were carefully placed around the body. A concern for the fate of the humans and a ritual burial. Uh, they speak of a deep feeling for uh, the spiritual quality of life. Uh, this <laughs> doesn't sound like the Neanderthal that I was taught about. Uh, the, again, problems after problems. Another one uh, showed up in Israel. And here's Bar Yosef of the Peabody Museum at Harvard, who found a number of Neanderthal skulls in caves up on Mount Carmel in Israel. But the problem was the modern preceded the Homo sapien in Neanderthals at Mount Carmel. The results have shaken the traditional evolutionary scenario, producing more questions and answers. Well, if you find the Neanderthals in, in a higher stratum, it's covered by travertine, the moderns were lower uh, yes, more questions than answers. Certainly doesn't fit the view we're taught in the textbook. Many have reported that the DNA has been analyzed and they were very different according to the DNA. And some of the press did report it that way. Uh, here from Scientific American, uh, some of the researchers believe the data can be interpreted differently. The amount of diversity between Neanderthals and living humans is not exceptional. We see more diversity in a number of species and in humans, and they point out some of the diverse types that have sometimes been found. It's within the range of variation that we can see today. More recently, very interesting and perhaps more definitive is the protein from Neanderthals has been sequenced. And uh, this was from, uh, from Iraq. And the team found the Neanderthal sequence was the same as modern humans. Guess what these things were? <laughs> these were people. According to Richard Leakey, he was unquestionably homo sapien. Uh, there was a ridiculous reconstruction. In fact, Howell says that uh, Busselin got the ankle bones on backwards. By all laws of physics, he should have fallen on his face. Uh, fully human language, the, oh, the DNA overlaps with humans. Moderns were, and the proteins were, were identical. The moderns were earlier, the brain was larger. Uh, they were religious and uh, were musical. <laughs> These were not only people, they, they were good people. And uh, according to the way they made their flutes and some of the tools, they were ahead of me, certainly in, in that department. They, they've been grossly slandered by ridiculous reconstruction. But these are people. Uh, Richard Leakey says, unquestionably homo sapien. Now, this is not a Sunday school class conclusion. This is what the leading authorities document. Now, we've got apes and we've got men. And where's the evidence that moderns evolved from ancestors? 
Well, it, uh, you can draw lines and you can line them up uh, like the pig to the bull to the man, but that's not science. That's not good evidence. Mary Leakey made an interesting observation about some of these trees that people line up, more recently quoted by Associated Press. Uh, since scientists can never prove, and this is what Leakey was saying, uh, you just infer based on similarities, you can never prove a particular scenario of human evolution. Because of that, he says, all these trees of life with their branches of our ancestors, she says, that's a lot of nonsense. Well, <laughs> there's good reason for her saying that. Now, she remains an evolutionist, unlike uh, her husband who gave up on Darwin. In fact, she commented on that saying he, he was a little touched before he died. <laughs> Uh, not exactly an objective analysis of what he was saying. But she does say these trees that are in the textbook that show this kind of human evolution and in this direction or by another authority said it, it's just a lot of nonsense. It's people drawing lines uh, and there are no lines on the bones. We can summarize the evidence then for the proposed ancestors of man this way. You go to the zoo and you can see a variety of apes. They don't all look the same. Uh, you can see a significant variety, all kinds, and there used to be more in the past, as uh, we saw from the, the documented experts. There were greater numbers of phyla, greater diversity in the past. Uh, we have fewer today. Some of them are extinct, and you can go back and find some of those that are extinct today, but they're apes. They're a part of the variety of apes that have existed greater in the past. And we look at the fossil record of humans, and likewise, we see a variety, and sometimes you can see what looks different uh, to us, to our eye, not different to their eyes, and uh, you could say some of them just look rather peculiar. <laughs> I understand people thinking that. But they're humans, and they're excellent humans, and we need to understand that. And that's what we see in the fossil record. We see apes, a variety. We see humans, some variety. Uh, now, they've desperately tried to shoehorn things in between, and at that point, I think they've just wound up looking foolish. But what you find is either apes or humans, or as uh, Dwayne Gish used to say, you take a little Incas opus and a little Hocus Pocus, and you come up with Pithecus spoofus. And that's what's been shoehorned in the middle. That's a picture of the actual evidence for fossil man. The record supports just exactly what the creationist would expect, a distinct, separate kind for each. A gap before the apes, a gap after the apes before you get to man. This is what we found in the fossil record earlier. The fossil record of men favors creation because of that, and uh, it is <laughs> against the idea of evolutionary progression. I want to make one more point before we conclude, referring back to some of the implications of evolution of man doctrine. If we look at origin of the species, that's really not the title. Many people are un unaware that it was actually origin of the species and preservation of favored races. This is a, a photo of the actual original edition, and you see the term favored races up about two-thirds of the way up. This uh, would never fly today, and so they edited it and took that out. But Darwin was a very devout racist, as were most of the people who were following his thinking. In Descent of Man, he makes this statement. At some future period, uh, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly uh, exterminate and replace the savage races. Now, you've got savage races and you've got civilized races, you see, and uh, one's going to exterminate the other. Uh, throughout the world. At that time, the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. He says the break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, as we may hope, than the Caucasian and some ape 
uh, today, uh, low as a baboon, instead of the now Negro or Australian and gorilla. Now, if that doesn't make your flesh crawl, it just, it, it's amazing. Uh, obviously, he's a hero in the minds of many, but if any so-called hero were to make that kind of a statement today, he wouldn't be a hero anymore. Uh, I think he needs to be exposed for what he is. Stephen Gould has acknowledged what happened as a result of his teaching. He says, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. Uh, increased by orders of magnitude. That's the fruit of the tree. And then he goes on to say the pervasive racism of the white scientist. Uh, this, this is typical following Darwin's book, Origin of the Species. They look to the activities of their own children for comparison with normal adult behaviors in lower races. Now, Stephen Gould is not saying this. This doesn't represent Stephen Gould, but he's talking about the typical white scientist uh, following Darwin's introduction of Origin of the Species and as a consequence of it. Uh, he gives an example of this kind of thinking from Henry Fairfield Osborne, uh, who was curator of the American Museum of Natural History, referred to earlier. What did he say? Now, it's not Darwin saying it, but he's quoting the head of the American Museum of Natural History. The standard intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old of the species Homo sapien. Negroes are not even in the same species, according to him. That's just thoroughly disgusting. But that's the fruit of the tree, even according to Stephen Gould. When we look at the world around us, we see differences in facial structure, in skin color, in brow ridges, in eye color, in hair color, in straight hair and curly hair, and sometimes there are suites of these variances that collect and you get dark skin and kinky hair, though you do have people with white skin that have kinky hair. Uh, in Ireland, you've got a lot of people with red hair and blue eyes and freckles, and usually there's not a lot of prejudice associated with that collection, but it does get associated with other collections foolishly. You look at these people, do you see a primitive man there? Many people will look at the fellow in the lower left-hand corner and say he looks primitive. This is Dr. Gulagong. He has a doctorate from Oxford. Now, I went to Cambridge. I don't really, we talk about people from Oxford, but <laughs> I assure you, this is a good man. Uh, he has excellent, uh, well, he has an IQ higher than 90% of our audience. He's a, a brilliant individual. Not, you thought he was primitive? Shame on you. It's really been interesting to see the results of our National Genome Project, a monumental scientific project that has demonstrated that when we look biologically, when we look at the genome, you can't find race. Here's a headline from the Union Tribune in San Diego, no trace of race. Genome Project proves that nothing biological separates peoples. It's not there. Often you can find greater difference between a brother and a sister than you can between what's called today a black man and a white man. Uh, Scientific American has explored the, the matter at length and found it doesn't exist in answer to that question. Uh, we've been looking at scientific evidence. At this point, let's just compare the models and the implication and use uh, a passage of scripture that will help define the position very much in contrast to that of the evolutionist, and we'll conclude with this. Genesis 3, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And I think that makes us all brothers. Sometimes I chide some of my black friends, you know, they talk about the brothers. I want to know why they're leaving me out. I think we're all children of the same mother and father and that we need to act as if we're brethren, and that's what creation produces. When you have that concept, that's where it leads. Not that all people go where it leads, but they should. Uh, evolution leads in a different direction.